Uh, and here is a small picture that basically illustrates that uh, power libraries in Python. Uh, so, so you are flying how that it's Python. So I just uh, in, uh, imported some sort of library and uh, it allowed me to float in, <clears throat> in the air. Uh, and uh, the other guy asked, but that's everything that import anti gravity. And he says, well, actually, I sampled everything in the medicine cabinet for comparison, but I think it's still Python. <clears throat> so probably, yeah, so everything is uh, about libraries in uh, Python. Uh, <clears throat> it is used uh, quite widely, so uh, you may find Python for uh, some sort of system administration. Uh, so many tools will be written in Python uh, for writing some simple GUIs, and uh, you may find libraries like PK, Inter, or PT are very useful. For internet scripting, so you probably heard about Django or or didn't than you do now. Uh, for database programming, for example, it has uh, nice connections with uh, MySQL and uh, through some sort of Python's class model called SQL Alchemy. So probably you heard about that. Uh, but why do we uh, love it? Especially, uh, it's because Python became some sort of standard in machine learning. So if you are uh, if you're willing to uh, do something like machine learning engineer. Uh, the first thing uh, <clears throat> you should know it's Python because everyone will expect from you that you know Python and then you can write some sort of scripts with uh, with Python. Uh, and uh, it will help you actually to do some rapid prototyping. Uh, it has many bindings to different libraries. So you can find that libraries in C++ or whatever, but uh, they almost all, they have some bindings for Python and you can call them in Python and do something with that. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, with that being said, uh, let's get to the Python itself. Uh, so probably the uh, the big picture. So uh, Python program structure. Uh, the program is composed of uh, modules. So some of these uh, modules uh, will be written by some very different people, and you will just import them and to reduce the functionality that you have in them. Uh, they all will contain uh, some sort of uh, statements that basically contain expression and expression create and process objects. Now, uh, everything is object in uh, Python. So uh, whatever you think, whatever you do in Python, you are basically operating with some sort of objects. Uh, there is an interesting uh, thing um, that not anyone, uh, I guess, grasps uh, good enough. Uh, in Python, uh, we don't have variables. We basically, we don't have variables in Python. We have names. Uh, and uh, I think it's a really uh, crucial point to understand a little bit better uh, what, uh, uh, what are we doing in the Python code. Uh, because some people may say that uh, there aren't something like no types or something like that. But in Python, there are types. But these types are connected to objects. Uh, at the same time, uh, you don't see that objects, but you can handle them with names. You give some names to these objects, and you can repurpose any name uh, to be connected with another object. And that will look for you as some sort of type changing. But it's not type changing. You are just reusing the same name for different objects. And the object living there, it has uh, quite... Uh, defined type. Uh, here is an example of simple Python code. So I'm just creating uh, two names, A and B. Uh, I am connecting them to objects representing numbers three and four, and I'm doing some sort of calculation. Uh, really nice touch about Python, uh, two types of division. So one division, uh, it keeps remainder. So when dividing one by two, I get 0 0.5. Uh, the second one, it drops remainder and I get uh, zero. <coughs> uh, so you may want to use that in some of your programs uh, when you are expecting uh, some result that is a natural number or something like that. So you want some integer, uh, you may want to perform this sort of division. Uh, you have no overflow in uh, integer numbers in Python. 
uh, but be careful. Uh, that is about integer, uh, integer numbers in the Python itself. If you use some sort of libraries, for example, NumPy, uh, you may get into the situation when you are doing some overflow. Because NumPy, for example, it uses types uh, like C++. So there is some number of bits that you should fit in. Uh, but if you are operating in the Python itself, you may not be worried about some sort of overflowing. Everything works nice and smooth. <clears throat> uh, we have different uh, operators in Python. So there is a small table of uh, these operators. And I hope that you have seen uh, either XAM or uh, some similar operators in other languages. So probably you should know uh, something about that. Uh, maybe I'll tell you a, a bit more later if we have time. <clears throat> uh, so there are bitwise operators, logical operators that you will want to use in your if statements and uh, some sort of other operation, operators like arithmetic operations and so on. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, here is an example of comparison uh, of Python integer and uh, C integer. Uh, here, once more, I'm reiterating uh, the idea of names uh, versus uh, some sort of variables. So in C or C++ or whatever, you have a variable. It's just a named part of the memory. So you have a computer memory, and you have some part of it, and you give a name to that part. Then you can write something to that part of memory, and you can read something from that part of memory. In Python, you have no direct access to the memory of the computer. You don't know what's happening there on the <coughs> behind the stages. You don't know what's going on. Uh, but in Python, you know that there are some sort of objects. For example, there is an object for integer, and this object, can, object contains information that this is integer one and it lives somewhere there. And you have some name connected to this object. Uh, this may look for you uh, like a little bit trivial or uh, why do we need, even need the information? So names, variables, who cares? Uh, but the problem, basically the problem starts when you are thinking about uh, so-called mutability and immutability of the objects. So all objects in Python can be divided into two groups. Uh, one group, it's mutable objects. You can change their internal state. So you are doing something to that object, it changes its internal state. And other objects are immutable. If you are doing something to that object, uh, you can basically change its state. You should create some new object with new information inside it. And then you can repurpose your name to <laughs> like reference that new object uh, but you can't change anything in the old object and this is quite interesting because sometimes that backfires when we are working with uh, different objects in python and when we are using functions so sending some object into the function we may end up in the situation where the function changes its internal state if it was mutable or in the uh, situation where we cannot change its state because the object is immutable. Uh, this is a quite subtle difference, uh, but I want you to know about it right away uh, because that should contribute uh, a little bit more to your understanding uh, why some bugs occur. So uh, there are some problems and you, may, and you will probably face. Here is a very simple, very basic example. Uh, and well, actually, I want to give you some small question. So I told you that we have two types of objects. Some are mutable, some are immutable. I can change internal state of the mutable object and all references to that object, to that object, they will be kept, kept in place. And I can have immutable objects. Doing anything to that object creates its copy and all new names or whatever, they are referenced to that new object. How do you think why? Uh, why do we need immutable objects? Can you guess some pluses or minuses of mutability or immutability? Uh, for safety. Safety, yeah, maybe yes. 
Maybe yes. Well, uh, yes, and safety like in the. Uh, uh, Safety for programmers to be <laughs> uh, Yeah, that may be helpful too. Yeah, so you may get into some sort of the situation. So you are writing some, I don't know, some program that will work on on some bank account or something like that, and you are and you are sending some data into some third party function. And it would be really great if you know that this data will not be changed by that third party function. Of course, you can do copying before sending any data to, to that function and so on. But what if you forget that or something like that? And it's really nice if uh, the, let's say, compiler, uh, <coughs> sorry, quote, quote, compiler, unquote, uh, will perform some checks for you. So, for example, this uh, immutability may contribute to that. Yes, uh, that's a good point. Uh, anything else you can come up with? Um, what do you think about, like, I don't know, memory usage, performance, any guesses? Like, for example, can immutability somehow contribute to that? Mm. 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 Generally, mutable objects, I think, mm. are, uh, has greater performance, or, or, I mean, smaller memory footprint because we don't need to create a new object as a result of our operation. We just change the existing object that sits somewhere in the memory. Yeah, that may be a good point. <coughs> so, uh, uh, but there is basically a little bit different angle of view. Uh, if you have an immutable object, uh, you can reuse that object in as many places as you want mm -hmm. and nothing bad will happen why because it's immutable it's no no one can change something inside there and here is a really simple example for you you see right now uh, on uh, the board uh, a simple program uh, i have name a and i'm connecting that uh, to number three remembering number three in python that's one that's an object of type like integer that contains information that it is number three. Okay, I have created that. <clears throat> and here is an arrow showing that connection between name and the object. Now I am writing B equals three. Once again, I have name B, I have object three. What happens in Python? It is referenced to the same object three. Uh, and the thing is, uh, well, that depends basically on uh, some internal parameters or how do you start your Python uh, interpreter and so on. Uh, but for small numbers to some certain threshold, um, <clears throat> uh, all uh, your newly created uh, constants like this, they will be referenced to the same object. And there is a method to count uh, how many references you have for some object. And if you do that for, for example, I don't know, number one, in any program you like, you will probably get some huge number. And everything uh, that it uh, contributes uh, to our saving of memory. So you are not creating uh, 10 objects that contain number 3. You create just one. And you reuse that once again and again and again. Uh, now I'm reusing the name A uh, to set it to new object like 5. And here is a new object created, and uh, this error shows that A is now repurposed, and uh, it's used to reference the object file. <clears throat> uh, well, basically, the same example. A equals 3, B equals A, they reference the same object. Now, A equals 5, it references a different object. Uh, why that matters, uh, I will show you a little bit later when we get to lists. I will show you that calling a function and uh, basically standing as an argument uh, something to that function, for example, list or a string or whatever, uh, you may get a little bit different uh, results that will depend on the mutability or immutability of that object. And that may create a very nested box that you don't want in your uh, programs. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, strings are a little bit special in Python. Uh, let's order a collection of uh, characters. Uh, there are no one character strings in Python. So you can have uh, something like char in, in C++. Everything is a string. Uh, they are immutable. So strings are immutable. Uh, that may be a big difference uh, because when you are dealing with some strings in C++ or whatever, you can change a character in that string uh, and it will take you, uh, let's say the complexity of this change is uh, something like 01. So you are just changing one character, nothing that happens. If you are doing uh, something like that in Python, you should copy the whole string and the complexity of this operation will be on. So you should copy every every single character and get a new string. And then and in this new string, you can set uh, some character to be different from the original string. <coughs> That's what happens. Uh, you have some sort of operations on strings. Uh, once again, I'm showing them here. So uh, you can concatenate uh, strings uh, like with a sign plus. You can repeat them. Uh, you can take indices and uh, slices, so hopefully you have uh, uh, seen this uh, syntax uh, before. Uh, <clears throat> when you are just asking for some character from the string, you are getting a string with one character only, so uh, no new type. Uh, you can get some slice from i to j and so on. <clears throat> uh, here are a few examples, so like concatenation of strings, uh, like repeating a string, uh, indexing a string. Uh, a really nice feature of Python uh, is uh, the fact that you can use uh, negative numbers uh, when referencing to some character in the string or some element of the list. Uh, these negative numbers basically mean that uh, you are counting from uh, the end of the string or uh, from the end of the list. Uh, so when we, I am asking uh, the character minus two, uh, that means that here is minus one, the last character, and here is the four before it, uh, character minus two. So this is A, and here we see this A in the output. Uh, <clears throat> indexing from the beginning of the string starts, of course, from zero, because all programmers count from zero. Uh, example of slicing, <clears throat> uh, the same string, and you see that I am slicing symbols from 1 to, uh, to 3. Uh, remember that uh, the last index is uh, never included. So when I'm slicing 1 to 3, it means that I will take character number 1 and number 2. I don't take, I don't take the number 3. So here is uh, number 0, here is P number 1, and a number two, and here is the result, P A, one, two, no three. Uh, <clears throat> without setting any uh, lower boundary, uh, you will get the whole string up to the end. So you are starting from symbol number one, and you are going, going, going up to the end. Uh, and here you are starting, if you don't uh, say where do you start, you will start from zero. And here is the slicing uh, all symbols uh, except the last one. Uh, a reminder for you that strings are immutable. You can set some symbol to to something new. I can change that. Uh, string does not support this sort of assignment. You should create uh, some new string with uh, this Y, for example, somehow inserted and so on. <clears throat> uh, here I am uh, repurposing name as just uh, to contain a new string, the, uh, the old string is utilized. Uh, so once again, the immutability, uh, it's, uh, it gets in the way and shows us <coughs> and in this example. <coughs> okay. Uh, what else do I want you to say? Aha, uh -huh. lists. Uh, so probably you have already programmed in some languages, so you all know how to, I don't know, some add integers, uh, divide them, and how the strings look like, and so on. Uh, that's good, uh, and so probably you will uh, really fast to get how, to, how that works in Python, so there are no problems. Uh, but there are a few uh, types uh, that are some sort uh, inherent to Python, uh, but you can't find them in different uh, programming languages. Or at least if you find them, they live in some external libraries. 
for example, like, uh, I don't know, STD in C++ or something uh, like that. So they are not some part of the language, but uh, they live in some sort of libraries. Even uh, if these libraries become some sort of standard and uh, are often sought as a part of the language. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, at least two types uh, that come to my mind at this point, uh, it's lists and it's dictionaries. Uh, so these are some exceptional types that I want you to know in Python. Uh, they are very useful, really nice types. And uh, dictionaries are basically, I guess, the reason why people sometimes say that uh, doing some sort of coding interview in Python, it looks like cheating. Why? Because you already have some structures in there, uh, like lists and dictionaries, uh, that can do uh, really a uh, lot of work for you, and they are part of the language. So when someone say, uh, says you, I want you to write some, some code, but don't use any libraries. Uh, if you do that in C++, you will need to implement a whole lot of stuff. If you do that in Python, you will get, for example, uh, for free, you will get lists, you will get dictionary, uh, and you can do some things that uh, you will need, uh, for example, writing a hash map on your own in C++ code or something like that. So it's really nice type, and I'm really encouraging you to use them as often as you can, uh, uh, because they are optimized and they are really, really good. <clears throat> what are uh, these lists? Uh, the problem is uh, the name list in Python in Python is, uh, I guess, really misleading. Uh, so what they call a list is not a list. Uh, because most of us, when we hear uh, the word list, uh, we think about some sort of data structure uh, that does the following. So you have some sort of nodes, you have some objects, and these objects are connected in sort of chain uh, with the help of uh, some pointers. But you don't have any point uh, any pointers in Python. You, you don't have that ability to use them. They exist, but they exist there somewhere under the hood. You don't see them. You don't uh, interact with them explicitly. Uh, and uh, list in Python is by no means uh, this sort of structure. It's really more close uh, to an error. You can use some part of, uh, parts of it. Uh, you can use indexing in the Python list. So in the Python you have, it's called list, but you can use indexing. You can do that uh, with uh, the list we are all thinking about because uh, you need to iterate through it to get some, I don't know, the dense component or 100th component. But in, but in Python, the structure that is called a list is basically much, much closer uh, to an array. And you will use them mostly as arrays. I don't know why did they call them this way, but that's the way it is. Uh, if you want to know what is under the hood of the Python, if uh, you are a little bit, uh, I don't know, interested in all that details, uh, here is the internal structure of the Python list, uh, how it looks like uh, down there, so all that uh, machinery. <coughs> Once again, you have a Py object, you have some sort of information about that object, uh, and uh, you have a pointer to some sort of internal structure. This internal structure is a dynamic array, dynamic array of pointers, and then all of these pointers, they reference different Python objects. So in the Python list, uh, you can keep uh, different components, components of different types, of uh, different, uh, quite different objects, and that will be uh, still okay. So I can keep there a number, a string, uh, some sort of um, hand-created object, whatever. So that will be okay for, for the list. Why? Because under the hood, that's uh, a dynamic array of pointers that can basically reference anything, so anything you want. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, if you don't know what is dynamic array and so on, don't worry. Uh, just think about uh, this uh, list as some sort of arrays and work with them as with arrays. Uh, if you don't, if you want to know more about them, uh, then please keep uh, like check what is dynamic array, and uh, that will probably give you much more understanding of how it works and why it works that way.
uh, once again, some simple operations for lists. You can create an empty list for uh, by using uh, square uh, brackets. Uh, you can uh, just uh, enumerate all the items you want to keep in the list. So uh, L2, for example, equals uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And uh, <clears throat> you get a list that contains that numbers. Uh, you can create nested sublists, so you can keep a list in a list and so on. Uh, please uh, note that uh, the you know, external uh, list, uh, it, um, it's like uh, two objects of different type. So one is a string and the other one is another list. So there we have it. So you can, once again, you can index slice and get the length of the, uh, of the list. You can concatenate them, you can sort them. So you have sorting for free uh, and uh, so on. <clears throat> Here are a few examples like concatenations of lists, uh, repeating of lists, and so on. Uh, example of list creation. Uh, here is once again the internal structure. So in the global frame, we have name L. It references some sort of object. That object is a list, and that list references few more objects that are strings. Uh, example of list uh, indexing and slicing. So once again, I'm performing slicing with, uh, I'm, I'm getting element number two. I'm getting sublist uh, with uh, two elements, like the first and up to the end, so one and two. Uh, I'm getting all elements except the last one. Uh, you can check that everything of that works. <clears throat> Uh, now I'm changing uh, the list, so I'm changing one of the elements of the list. It's index assignment that works with lists. It doesn't work with uh, strings, but it works with lists. Uh, <clears throat> I am doing uh, some sort of slice assignment. Uh, once again, you see how the list changes. Uh, so you see spam x spam. If I'm doing that slice assignment, it changes to eat more spam. Uh, please note that this reference it does not change, so no new objects are created. Uh, this is the same list, but it's mutable, so it's internal, uh, whatever it contains inside, uh, that can be repurposed or changed somehow. <clears throat> and once again, I'm doing some sort of attempt to that list. So you can check all these functions, they are quite simple. Uh, <clears throat> okay, here is... Uh, one catch. So I am creating name L. I am creating some new name. I call it L old. Uh, and you see that these two names are now referencing the same object. Uh, here is an interesting uh, thing. Uh, when I will start changing something in this list, how do you think what will happen? Another object? Um, no, that's the catch. The problems that will change, yes? Yeah, so the list will change, and all these names, they will, of course, reference the list with the changes. So here is the catch. When we have strings, if I try to change something in that string, a new string will be created, and the old names that are still referencing the old string they will be unaffected. So nothing will change for them. Uh, but right now, I'm doing something with uh, a list. So I have a list. The list is mutable. So when I will change something in that list, I will get into the situation uh, where new objects uh, uh, change old objects. I just, well, let's say the other way around. Uh, so uh, old names will reference a changed object. So that's the case. I will show you this in uh, this code. Uh, this code, well, illustrates basically a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, creations uh, of new lists uh, with copying. So here is a good way of creating a new list. If you don't want to spoil your old names, you will create a new list with uh, this sort of syntax. So we use this double dot for saying I am taking a slice of a list, but I'm taking the whole internal content of that list. Mm -hmm. 
that creates me a new object. You see that in the image. So L new one, it references a new object. Now I'm doing L new two. So I'm adding something to the L. When I'm adding something to L, uh, I'm still creating a new object. And when I'm slicing uh, that, I'm creating a new object. Uh, so the thing is uh, that in some cases, when I am doing uh, slices, I am creating uh, new lists. If I don't do slices, if I do just some changes to L, uh, <clears throat> I will get changes in that list and all my old variables will reference a uh, changing list. Um, okay, here is two-dimensional array. <clears throat> Okay, I'll show you that. Uh, here is the creation of two-dimensional array uh, with the list. So sometimes we use that. So we just list containing lists and few methods to reference um, internal values from that. Uh, nothing so interesting. Mm, okay. Uh -huh, dictionaries. Uh, yeah, I want to show you some sort of uh, one more uh python type it's called dictionary uh and dictionaries are so uh some sort of tables of object references so you can think about them in that way so if you know what is a hash map you can think about them like some sort of a hash map but it's just incorporated into the core language and you can use it uh, just out of the box <clears throat> uh here is an example of syntax uh quite similar in some sense to lists. For example, you can create that uh, by using uh, some sort of brackets. It's just not square brackets, some of these uh, curly brackets. Uh, since this is some sort of uh, hash table, uh, you should provide uh, key and value to create it properly. You should provide, uh, provide key and value. Uh, as you see, we write keys and values uh, using the uh, comma. So you write spam, two dots, and then number, and so on. <clears throat> so you uh, you do that. Uh, here are examples of so dictionaries in action. So you create a dictionary, and uh, you are getting value by key. So I am sending a key there, and I'm getting value. I can get number of entries in the dictionary by calling len. So it will give you the number of entries. Uh, I can get keys or values using function keys or fu function values, and I can iterate uh, through them. So if you ever need to iterate through keys of the dictionary or through, uh, through values, uh, you can use these other functions. <clears throat> uh, you can create uh, entries on assignment. Uh, so please be careful with that. Uh, sometimes we expect that when I have a dictionary and there is some key missing, and I'm trying to uh, to write something like that dictionary that missing key equals to something, I may expect that some error will occur. But it's not in Python. It will create a new key for you and put that object that you are equating to with uh, in connection to that. So uh, if you have already this key in your dictionary, it will rewrite its value. If you don't have, it will add it to the dictionary. Uh, that may be so, uh, some source of uh, some errors in your format. So that may be the, uh, the case. <clears throat> uh, few more examples of creating dictionaries uh, using brackets, uh, using keyword dict. Uh, you will see that maybe you can create it field by field. Uh, once again, I'm just uh, <clears throat> adding new fields. Uh, you can uh, Create it from pairs um, and so on. So there are many uh, many cases you will want to create the dictionaries and many methods to do that. Uh, here you see uh, once again using of uh, the dictionary. So here is the dictionary table. It contains uh, a table that uh, references uh, language, uh, let's say creator, uh, with respect to the language. Uh, and now I'll try to get a creator for, for example, Python. So I'm getting creator of Python, Vito1 Rossum. 
uh, just uh, using all that square bracket syntax, so it's really simple. So like getting some uh, element from the list, uh, you are sending a number to there. I want tenth element, I want, I don't know, 21st element, and so on. Uh, getting that from a dictionary is basically the same, but you are uh, sending some sort of uh, key into there. So I want a uh, creator of Python. It returns you Gido one blossom from this dictionary, of course. Uh, and uh, we can iterate uh, through the dictionary. So right now I'm iterating through keys of the dictionary and I'm printing that. Uh, so here you see like when they appear, uh, when I iterate uh, through the dictionary. <clears throat> that may be very useful because we often want to iterate uh, through dictionaries and change something there or get some additional information. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, some usage notes. Um, when uh, you may want to use some dictionaries, uh, of course, uh, except that uh, straightforward cases uh, when you use them as hash maps. Uh, in some cases, you want to substitute uh, to substitute uh, a list with a dictionary. Uh, how do you think? What case can it be? So I have a situation that list uh, theoretically uh, could have handle. So like it's linear, I need some linear structure that keeps some internal data and I want to reference that data by index. But for uh, for some reason, I, want, I don't want to use lists, I want to use a dictionary. Uh, how do you think why? You just describe the use case for that. You want to have. You want to have some inner structure in array like data type, and uh, for example, you have one hundred elements in there, and you want to insert like first, and then ninety ninth, and then fifty for some your logic, and you can do it with dictionary because the index is just a key for the dictionary uh, and yeah. there is no issues with uh, like getting out of the bounds for the index yeah that sounds really good well actually i had a comment in chat that uh like <clears throat> it helps with the memory basically yes it, it has some connection to that um the answer is totally correct uh so it may happen uh that they want some linear structure in memory uh, uh but it's uh, a sort of very sparse array so i want something like very sparse array so i want a linear array but i will use uh for example the first element the 100th element to the element uh, 1099 and that's all so i'm basically using just three elements uh, but their indices are very very far away uh, and that will be probably uh, really wasteful to create uh, an array of that size so i don't want to create an array uh, uh, that can potentially contain uh, let's say a million uh, elements when i'm going to use just three of them so that's really based. Uh, and I can't get, get out uh, uh, with a list in this situation uh, because if I try to reference some element uh, that is out of bounds, that is somewhere be uh, behind that uh, upper boundary of the indices, I will get an error. So there is nothing to do. I Either I create some huge list, uh, so huge that any index I want to reference will be within that list. Uh, but in this case, I'm creating a huge number of objects and that's really wasteful. Or I'm retreating to using dictionary. And I'm using dictionary as a sort of sparse list. So uh, that may be a good idea to, uh, to use. 
uh, dictionaries are really good in many situations. Uh, they help us with uh, this sort of uh, reading sparse errors. That's good. Uh, they may help you uh, with getting rid of uh, many uh, ifs in your program. So if you have many statements like if, if something, then something, uh, the next line, if something, then something, and so on, so on, so on, uh, you can get away with using dictionary, and that will sub substitute you for uh, this long chain of uh, if statements. Uh, that really makes uh, the program a little bit cleaner, so that's a really good idea. Uh, very similar uh, type to list uh, are tuples. Uh, basically not saying anything about them because everything is the same as for list except to one detail, uh, they are immutable. Uh, once again, a tricky question for you. How do you think, why do we need, why do we need some sort of list and some sort of quote immutable list unquote or this tuple, tuples? If it's a data set, for example, and we want to use it throughout the program, we uh, want to have an unmodified uh, data set. Yeah, so if I want to send some data into some function, I want some warranty that it doesn't do anything to that data. So it may be a good idea to, uh, to send there not a list, but a tuple. So yes, that's correct. <clears throat> Uh, okay, a small reiteration of data types we saw, so numbers, strings, list, dictionaries, tuples. Uh, I don't tell you anything about files that's uh, out of scope. Uh, and you see that two of them are mutable, lists and dictionaries. Uh, the rest are immutable. So uh, <clears throat> I think I have some sort of examples uh, down there and i will show you the difference how the difference between mutability and immutability uh can get you in some sort of uh, problem uh one more concept uh, about copying of the object so when i'm creating some object in python and i'm connecting that to the name a then i'm writing b equals a mm. that means that b will reference the same object it happens that I want B to reference another object, a copy of this object. Uh, and there are a uh, few uh, like methods of doing this copy, and you can get uh, into troubles if you do this copy wrong. Uh, look at this example. Uh, so here are uh, very simple references. So A was referencing an object, and I am writing like B equals A copy. I have copied the object, and now B references a new object. But uh, these objects may reference some further objects, like something, uh, something another. So, for example, we have a list that references some another list that references numbers, and so on. And if you are doing just copying, please note that only the first layer of these objects is copied. Everything else is left. And you still have references from these new objects. You have still references to that old things, like there behind the stages. Mm. And that may, may be the source of errors. Uh, so uh, if you change something through this object, you change something in here, in this green area, uh, you will see that changes through the name B and its new object. You will see these changes. So that may be the case when you are operating with lists, for example, and you have nested lists, one list that contains some another list that contains something else and something else. Uh, if you do just a copy, it still doesn't help you to resolve all the problems. What you should do, you should do a bit copy. That will create your entire different tree of objects referencing each other. Uh, so I want you to, to know about this sketch because it really brings sometimes really, uh, really bad bugs into your code, and it's really hard to debug them. Because you don't see all this internal structure with all that pointers and so on. So everything is there under the hood. What you see is just names A and B, and you're trying to reference something to that A and B. And it's really hard to know sometimes, are you referencing the same object 
or are you referencing something different? Uh, and if you don't catch these uh, errors at the beginning, it may be really uh, complicated to find them uh, then. So I want you to know about this uh, sort of quality of Python and uh, be careful with that. So if you are copying some objects, uh, sometime you will need to, uh, to have a deep copy to do everything correctly. Sometimes that's in, um, copying is enough. Sometimes you don't need to copy anything. So that depends. <clears throat> uh, okay, what else do I want you to show? Uh, list references. Okay, let's look what I have <clears throat> here for you. Uh, two lists, L and M. L references a list with numbers 1 to 3, M references a list of different objects to trains and reference to list L. Uh, okay, now I'm changing uh, the L. So I'm changing uh, L in here. I changed it. Since L is mutable, you see that uh, it changed. Now it's, it's it changed from 2 to 0. Uh, and if I will reference it from the list M, I will have the result change. Uh, so here, here we have results of printing. So here I printed M once again. And you see that it contains now zero. It does not contain uh, the two. So this is the case of uh, the mutability of the objects. Uh, what would happen if this uh, was not a list, but a string, for example? How do you think? We have a really complicated situation. So I have created a list that uh, contains some different lists. Uh, but as you see how I created that list, uh, it started to reference the already existing object in the memory. Yeah? So I am creating some L. I am creating M that contains L. And it starts referencing the already existing object in the memory. And you see that when I am applying any changes to that object in the memory, uh, I, I'm starting to see that changes through the object M. Uh, why does that happen in the first place? Because, because it's not uh, different, uh, it's, uh, just a reference of okay. object. Okay. Um, yes, because it's reference, but the other very uh, big reason what I'm trying to tell you is the mutability. List is mutable. List is mutable. If it was immutable, uh, you will never get into that sort of situation. Why? Because if you would try to change anything in there, that will lead you to creating a new object and the name you were ref referencing it through at the moment of the change will be repurposed to now reference that other, that new object. And the old object, it can live its own life. We don't care about it. We will create a new object, but not in this case, because list is mutable. And when we reference that list and we introduce some changes, the internal state of that object changed and now we are seeing that changes through all the rest objects that we're referencing it. So this is the uh, the case. <clears throat> uh, and this is the thing I want you to uh, be always aware about. And uh, because it really uh, brings uh, programs. So it really brings some nasty bugs into our programs. Uh, and when someone is uh, just starting uh, doing something with Python, uh, they really often get in troubles uh, because of all this mutability and immutability. And this is the reason uh, why now I think that Python is not so simple as uh, people uh, often present it. So yes, right now it's often used as the first programming language uh, almost everywhere. So everybody starts programming with Python. Uh, in some sense, that um, looks like a nice idea for me because I was starting my time using uh, Drupal Pascal. And <clears throat> I like Python more, let's say. 
but on the other hand, it's not so simple as you were told. So yeah, it's easy to write with something like bring whole world and you get the whole world. Well, yeah. Maybe it's even uh, easy to get some sort of uh, UI. So maybe you import some library and you get some sort of uh, some window, some buttons or whatever. So it may be still simple for you. Uh, but there are some internal concepts like this mutability and immutability and some other things that are basically caused by the fact that uh, with uh, the Python, like more interpreted language, you are getting a little bit for, uh, further from the uh, all the internals of the computer, and you may be uh, sometimes lost in all that concepts because uh, they are not so straightforward. So people are often afraid of, let's say, some pointers or whatever. Uh, no, pointers are quite simple. Uh, C, uh, C language is quite simple, so that's okay. Uh, but when you are getting to some concepts when everything is hidden from you under the hood, uh, who knows what happens right there, and you are getting some strange results, that's not okay. And I hope that uh, uh, with this sort of lecture, I'm bringing you some more understanding of that immutability and mutability of the objects in Python, and that will contribute uh, to your understanding of uh, to your overall understanding of the language. So maybe you will do uh, a little bit less of errors or something like that, uh, or at least you will be aware that uh, manipulating with the lists it may get you into some sort of problems because they are referencing something that is referencing something that is referencing some object that you changed because it was mutable. <clears throat> it's really often uh, the case. Uh, uh, excuse me, what? can we please come back for the previous example just for one second? Uh, yes, so please, if uh, list, so I, I just want to like reiterate, if list yes. were to were, if list were to be immutable, so in this yes. case we would create the L one two three and then M that will contain L within it, and then if we were to change L, it will create a new list which will be like one zero three, and L will yes. be referenced in this new list. But the old version of quote unquote L as one to three will be will be still existing inside of M, and the only way to reference it would be to go to M to the first element of M and further in, right? Yes, absolutely correct. That's it. So if lists were immutable, it, it would... does really remind a lot of uh, stuff from pointers in C plus plus. Just it's it's like just hidden under the hood under those equal signs yes, in c++ you're like it's like you, you're like you're like more descriptive while you're programming because you are mainly saying that's a pointer to reference in that scene and this pointer is reference in that scene and that's a copy but that's a reference here just a, here is just like hidden inside yes that's exactly the case so that's exactly the case Basically, pointers and memory, all that stuff, they are more connected to the internal structure of the computer. So computer gives you the ability to reference some memory with a pointer, just saying, I want uh, the number that is stored uh, in some block of memory, number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you get it. Uh, and uh, this, of course, it's not, uh, I want to say that it's not like a unique figure of C++ or whatever. So if you have a programming language that uh, deals on more on a lower level with the computer, you will always get some sort of pointers and so on. If you are using some higher level programming language, it, run, it still runs on the computer. It's still written on something that is basically interacting with all that hardware inside the computer. So you will always have all that pointers and all the things inside of your uh, either interpreter, is, if that is interpreted programming language or whatever. So that's always uh, the case. And in this case, when we are dealing with Python, that's exactly as you, as you said. So we have all the pointers, we have everything that, but it's just hidden from us. And because developers of Python said that it's uh, they don't like all that stuff, they want to do something different that may be a little bit simpler for people to understand. Uh, but as I at least as I now see, uh, they have uh, some sort of hidden some things that maybe it would be better to uh, to be left uh, like more explicit or something like that. 
so yes, we still have all the pointers, we still have all that stuff, but it's just hidden from us. And we don't interact with them explicitly, but whatever we do, it has some influence and where do they lead us? <clears throat> and here is one more extreme case uh, of using all, all those things. So I am creating uh, a list, L456, uh, uh, and I am creating uh, two uh, more lists, X and Y, uh, with uh, two different methods. Uh, so X is created uh, with a method that basically creates a new list uh, that is filled with uh, these elements, and Y is created uh, with a different, with a little bit different syntax. So uh, please note this uh, square brackets. <coughs> so I'm just creating here uh, on next, I'm just creating a new list that contains elements repeated four times. Uh, here it is referenced in the image. And here I create uh, a list uh, that contains references to the original list. And it contains them four times. So these four cells are basically referencing the same object. And if I do any changes to that object in the memory, what I will get, I will get changes in any cell, in every cell on the list Y. Because they are referencing the same object list in the memory, it is mutable. I do changes to that, I get changes everywhere. Uh, you see the result of uh, printing right now. So we had number five here in every uh, element, and here we have number zero everywhere. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, some sort of statements, uh, as I think you probably know some of them, but I will just uh, really quickly uh, go through them. <clears throat> and through statements, uh, printing as simple as print whole world. Uh, you can print many different values uh, by uh, using uh, just comma. Uh, so that's <clears throat> uh, that's really simple. Um, statement if uh, or if selection. Uh, so. Uh, Please note the uh, syntax. Uh, it differs a little bit, well, not a little bit, it really differs from C++ uh, or whatever you studied before. Uh, well, many languages uh, have syntax that looks like C language, uh, but Python uh, does a little step aside. Uh, so, for example, uh, in, in these statements, uh, you won't see any uh, currently or whatever brackets. So, uh, we don't use brackets. Uh, we don't use uh, round brackets uh, for uh, like encompassing that statement for if. Uh, but please note uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> this column at uh, the end uh, of uh, this statement. <coughs> so we uh, we use them to mark that the statement ended, and now we are going to the rest of the code. Uh, please note that we don't use any curly brackets, but instead uh, now we. Uh, basically uh, do some, I don't know how to call that, uh, some tabulation uh, to make uh, to make sure that this code is inside of if and the rest of the code is uh, outside of it. Uh, <clears throat> so you should be always aware of the level uh, where are uh, you. If you have many nested ifs, uh, it can be a little bit complicated because that clutters all your view and uh, it may be uh, hard to say, so are you now on the level of number five or number six? On the other hand, if you are getting uh, a lot of uh, these uh, nested uh, constructions like ifs or some cycles or uh, whatever, uh, that may be a good point to think that something went wrong, that your program is becoming a little bit overcomplicated, and maybe you want to take some part of it into a separate function, for example, or you may want to simplify some parts of it or do something like that. So probably that may be the case. So uh, on the one hand, it makes uh, reading a bit uh, complicated, at least for long programs and uh, 
uh, really uh, some deep levels of nastiness. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it may be a hint for you that something is going wrong and you probably should form some sort of uh, refactoring of your program and doing something better or simpler or whatever. Uh, here is an example of using dictionary instead of uh, a long way of uh, different ifs. Uh, that's basically the example I, I have promised you. Uh, if you need to check something against, um, I don't know, some long line of ifs, so if, for example, s equals spam, f, if x equals ham, if s equals x, and so on, so on, so on, and do something on each step, uh, you can use a dictionary to collect all the keys that you may want to test against and all the values uh, you want to get at that point. It can be a number. It can be a reference to a function. So you can call a function uh, using uh, its its name. You just write its name in here and you will get reference to a function and you can call that. So you take by key from dictionary a function and then you call that function. That, that may be a really simple way to perform. <clears throat> to get away with all that ifs, so if you don't want to see them in your code. And it's really good if you don't see them in your code, because the code gets really cluttered and hard to read. So yeah, I, I recommend you to, <coughs> to use this sort of trick to make it a little bit simpler. Uh, yes, please. And which one uses less memory? Uh, if, multiple ifs or dictionaries? Mm, actually, I don't know. <laughs> so it's hard to tell just of the hand. I think that they will use more or less the same memory. So if, if you don't get too picky and we don't try to measure everything to the last byte, I don't think that uh, one dictionary will uh, really make a big difference. Uh, but that makes your code um, quite uncluttered because mm. uh, sometimes uh, we want something I don't know. Uh, in C++, for example, we have a switch statement. So sometimes you have a really, really long switch. In Python, you don't have any switches. Uh, you do just uh, multiple of if statements. Uh, but in multiple of if statements, if you sometimes open some third party code and you see that there's something like that, some really, really long list of that if statements, you look at them and you think, um, what's happening here? So what, what is that? Uh, and encompassing everything into one dictionary, uh, giving that dictionary some meaningful name uh, may really uh, be a good idea. Uh, here is an example, one more, uh, of using functions in there. Uh, so here I have function. One is called linear, the other one is called square. And I'm really using here functions. Maybe you haven't seen this syntax. It's lambda functions. Uh, There's functions uh, that I can create in one line in, in Python. Uh, here are the argument and uh, here is the uh, result. So you just return x or x squared. And I'm doing the choice really simply. I'm saying I want a square. So I get the function and I'm immediately applying it to the argument arc, which is two, and I get the result four. <coughs> Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, what else do I want to just say? Um, so never, never forget all that, uh, columns. Uh, you will write a lot of columns in Python every time you write if statement or for statement or why spelled statement or whatever. Uh, blocks, uh, block boundaries are detected by line indentation. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, as indentation, you can use any combinations of spaces and tabs. Uh, that's okay for Python. You can even mix them. Uh, but you should be consistent at least, uh, throughout, uh, one, um, uh, let's say five. Uh, so I wanted to say something like translation module, uh, but let's say uh, just one file. So if you are opening some PI file and you are writing something in that file, uh, you can use any combinations of spaces and tabs to um, get all that indentations and to get different levels of uh, nestedness in your code. 
but this should be consistent uh, throughout it. It can be that I use uh, once I use uh, three spaces, uh, then a few lines slower, I use, for example, five spaces. That's not okay. If I use three spaces, I use three spaces. If I use ten spaces, I use ten spaces. At least in one point. <clears throat> Uh, okay, we don't use a uh, uh, big number of uh, this sort of uh, semicolons like in C++. Uh, you can basically put them in the code and it will still work, Pythonic code, with uh, this sort of syntax. Uh, but that will, uh, well, that will show <laughs> that you were more working with C++ than with, with Python. So uh, Pythonic programmers never do that. <clears throat> okay, uh, what else? Uh, different uh, true tests. Uh, as in C++, you can expect like operators like reader uh, or uh, lower to work well, that's okay. Uh, different uh, difference with C++, but I heard that last ver versions uh, basically look very similar. Uh, you can use, uh, instead, uh, you, you can use OR and AND. Well, basically, you should use OR and AND as the connections uh, for your different true statements. So you write it just in words. You write OR, you write AND, and so on. Uh, in C++, you will uh, probably use something like that or, or that. Uh, you don't do that in Python. <clears throat> Uh, my son thing, one more, uh, is the ability to uh, check whether the list or a dictionary is empty. Uh, it evaluates to a blink statement of false if there is nothing inside the list uh, or if there is nothing inside the dictionary. Uh, so you don't need to do any checks like uh, getting the length of the list or whatever. You can just use it as it is in the if statement and that will be okay. It will be converted to false or to true uh, within that statement, depending on what you are doing. Uh, there are a few more catches with that and and or. Uh, they are not always converting uh, converting everything into uh, Boolean statements, and sometimes they leave objects as uh, they are. Uh, basically, they are not. Uh, they're not even convert, uh, converting. Uh, converting are uh, comparisons like uh, greater, greater or equal, not equal, and so on. Uh, they are uh, giving you some boolean number like true or false. Uh, while or and and are keeping the objects as they are, and there are some rules uh, that may look a, a little bit complicated for you, so I don't want to. Uh, uh, like to get into it, uh, but please note that in some cases uh, you may get some object from applying or to different objects or uh, to applying and to different objects. So that may that may be the okay. case. Uh, so here is an example. Like I'm doing two and three, and I'm getting three. I'm doing three and two. I'm getting two, and uh, so on. There are some uh, some rules. Uh, for example, and return the, the last thing for you. Uh, if everything is true and you return some left uh, object in that change uh, chain, uh, if you uh, use or, uh, or will uh, return you the first uh, object that can be converted to true in that chain and so on. Uh, but I don't want you to get into that. It's a little bit, um, it's not like complicated, but that may flutter the view of the overall language. Uh, Yes, one more catch that true and false are basically aliases for zero and one in Python. So you can write something like 10 multiplied by true plus one and you will get 11. So that's okay. <clears throat> uh, that's a Pythonic way. Uh, while statements, as you might expect them, uh, you are doing something uh, until uh, the moment that you get false. A uh, very interesting internal thing in uh, Python, um, I, I will not get into it in this lecture, that will be a little bit uh, too overwhelming for me, uh, but probably you have heard about exceptions. So maybe you have even uh, used them in some different languages like C++ and so on. Uh, in Python, exceptions are uh, 
some inherent part of the uh, of the language. Uh, and to feel better how inherent is it, uh, there are basically uh, when you are doing something, uh, there are two strategies that uh, programmers uh, jokingly call uh, one of them uh, look uh, before you leap, L B Y L, I guess. And uh, the other one uh, is called um, something like uh, it's easier uh, to ask forgiveness than permission. I don't remember the acronym for that, but uh, it's something like that. So it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Uh, what it means, what are these two strategies uh, when we are talking about uh, the programming languages and basically develop, developing some software? Well, that's, that would be an interesting question for you. How do you think? Uh, what are the strategies of development uh, of uh, software uh, when you are uh, go when you are going with LBYL, we uh, look before you leave. And if you are going with, it's easier as forgiveness than permission. Any guesses? Uh, Maybe look before you leave, it's like a uh, check whether everything is alright before doing anything, so there won't be an expected uh, behavior. And uh, another one is like, uh, let it be everything which possible, we will handle it. Yeah, yeah. Any exception? I guess it can be somewhat like ideologically, uh, well, like we have a while and do while cycles in C. So while is checking the condition before even entering the cycle, and if it's false, it will never enter it. And do while will, as I remember, always have at least one iteration, and only after that it will check the condition while. Well, um, yeah, the correct uh, thing that you said that uh, the first approach is checking everything before we do anything. Uh, so if uh, that has a really wide, uh, let's say, application. So if I am calculating some function and I want to do, I don't know, I want to do some division in that function. So uh, look before you leap will tell you, well, before doing that division, please check, aren't you dividing by zero, for example? So that may be the case. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, accurate programming. So you are checking everything before you are trying to do something. And if you uh, found that everything is okay, only then you are doing some operations and now you are guaranteed to get the result. So I'm dividing, I check that I'm not dividing by zero, so I will always get some meaningful result. The other approach uh, that we call, uh, so uh, it's easier to ask uh, forgiveness than permission. It means that I'm doing whatever I'm doing. If something gets wrong, if something gets wrong, I'm just throwing uh, an exception. So I'm basically putting all the burden of checking uh, the uh, input data uh, on the one who called that function. So you want a good result, then put correct data. If some data was wrong, okay, I tried to do, didn't work. Here's an exception for you. <clears throat> and the Python, it gets away with uh, this approach. So if you are coding C++, you can do, basically you can do both. Uh, but in the paradigm of Python, it's uh, really common and mostly used the approach uh, easier as forgiveness and permission. Uh, and that's why I'm telling you that uh, the exceptions, I will not show you them today, but you probably know at least at some intuitive level what's, what they are, how do they look like, where you have seen them in C++, for example. And, and what I want you uh, to know that they are incorporated into the core of the language uh, so deeply uh, that they are even thrown internally uh, in some cases. And one of that cases can be the end of the, for example, four cycle. So when you are doing some four cycle, you are iterating, for example, through some lists or um, whatever, when you are getting to the end of that list or to the end of some range or uh, something like that, an exception is thrown internally that you are at the end of the list. So such an unexpected situation, the list ended. Who would expect that? Yeah. 
it contained five elements and it ended at, at some point. So this is the interesting thing. So uh, exceptions in Python, they are inherent, they are incorporated in the language and they are thrown all the way around. Uh, so in, if uh, you were coding C++, you may have seen some styles of coding uh, when people are turning off all that exceptions and they are telling, I don't want to code with any exceptions. So I will write my code some some way. I don't need any exceptions because that I bring some overhead or whatever happened. <laughs> At least I have seen this uh, sort of style of coding. In Python, you'll never do that because it's internal part of the language and you will get exception thrown anytime you are ending some cycle. So you write a cycle, you get an exception. And that's a normal behavior of the language. <clears throat> so that's really an interesting part of the Python. So maybe at some point uh, you will want to know a little bit more about exceptions in Python and I don't know, read some some book where it's described in more details. <clears throat> uh, okay, here is uh, one more example of uh, while cycle. Uh, here I'm scooping away first char character of uh, the X until it gets empty. Uh, once again, we don't need any uh, explicit conversion to uh, some sort of Boolean or whatever. Uh, while cycle will uh, work really well. If it uh, gets an empty string, it is treated as false, and while cycle is ended. Uh, so it's a really nice feature to have, so you don't need to check something like lengths or whatever. Uh, you get everything autom automatic. Uh, one more simple while. Not even sure what it's doing. It's adding uh, <clears throat> number one to A and comparing A to B uh, until uh, basically A and B get uh, equal and uh, the cycle stops. <clears throat> Uh, you can use break, continue, and fast in, in the loops. Uh, a really nice feature to have. Uh, break exits uh, the uh, loop. So if you are saying break, the loop is broken. So you are getting away from it. Uh, maybe quite useful if you are writing something like while true and doing something and checking conditions somewhere inside the loop. Uh, maybe some algorithms are easier to write this way. Uh, continue. Nice thing if you are uh, at some point, if you know uh, that you don't need all the rest statement of the loop, but you don't want to skip uh, the whole uh, loop. So maybe uh, you are iterating through some list and there are still some objects you want to explore in that list. You just know that this object is of no, no more use. You don't want to do anything with it. You do continue, you re return to the beginning of the loop and you are uh, iterating through some other objects. Now, and one really Python thing, a while and for loops have else statement. Probably you haven't seen that anywhere before, uh, but yes, they have else statement, really rarely used. I uh, haven't seen that in a while, uh, but it's still a part of the language. Uh, you can get into the else statement uh, if you didn't break uh, the loop. So if a uh, loop was iterated normally, uh, you didn't call break, uh, at least, well, we can call it more than once. You didn't call break. Uh, then you can get into the else part of the loop and perform some statements there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's kind yeah. of pointless. Uh, uh, break just changes what uh, just breaks the loop anyway. So does continue, so it's only a plus. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's not that way. So let me show you. Uh, here is the case. <clears throat> so you have some, uh, some loop, let's say it's, uh, for, uh, let's say X in, uh, I don't know, let's, let's write some list, for example, one, two, three, four. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing some, some four. Uh, and I'm having some statements here. I don't know, some if. Something happens, I don't know, then I do uh, break. Mm -hmm. And I'm having else part of this loop, and I'm doing some, something here, so whatever I do. Uh, and I have some more statements in here. Uh, if I iterate uh, through this loop and I never break, 
I apply all these statements in here to all these objects. So I, I get all this thing here. And then I do everything that is here. So that's okay. If I did a break at some point, so for example, I iterated through one, through two, and on three, I'm doing some, some sort of break. Yeah, so if X, for example, equals three, uh, I'm doing these iterations. At some point, I'm getting to here, I am breaking, and I am skipping this part and this part. I'm getting into here. Uh, yes, yes, please. Uh, is it Break uh, just goes outside the loop anyway. Yes, it goes outside the loop yes. and outside the else statement. But uh, what, why do we have separate else statements? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I understand, if we didn't put else, nothing would change. Uh, you have some, uh, you see, after this loop, uh, you have this block of code. Uh, that will or will not work uh, depending on that. Ah, I know what I do. Uh, I will rewrite this code, uh, code a little bit for you. Uh, oh, God. If you don't have the element uh, 3, then else uh, would be needed, for example. Yes. Uh, else is basically part of the for loop in this case. It uh, yeah. just complicates the the condition on which uh, loop is going and when it ends. So like you can go through from one to 10 mm -hmm. and then from 20 to 50, but between 10 and 20, you will do something in health. Let me show you an equivalent code that will do basically the same thing. And that will possibly uh, make things a little bit clearer. Uh, okay, so here are my statements. I will something in here and still doing something here. Now I write F. So here is an equivalent code. Uh, so it's really bad I don't have another color, uh, but this part. It's essentially this part. Uh, so we can, it's, it's, uh, it's very weak color. Maybe try a different marker. No, it's um, see. This is the second one I'm trying. <laughs> okay, maybe this one. Yeah, this one is much better. Okay, so this part of code I have in else is the same as this part of code. Just to co copy paste. But you see uh, the difference. Uh, so here I have a variable, break, and I'm checking this uh, variable if I did break or I did not break in this cycle. Uh, so maybe it break goes outside the cycle. It's not executed uh, in any case. Like, uh, well, it just go Yes, it goes outside the cycle. But yeah. if we didn't break, for example, I had a yes. break in this list. Yeah, just. For yeah. example, I don't what's the point of checking if we uh, go uh, if we run this code, we didn't break the cycle anyway. Uh, what's the point of the check? No, no, no. Uh, you break. Uh, you do break, uh, but before this break, uh, you perform some operations on one and two. So you did something. Yes. So you may have changed some information somewhere outside in yeah. there. On three, uh, you have a uh, break. And then, uh, if you have break, you are performing that this code. But it may happen that you haven't three in this list. So maybe there was no three. And you have performed some operation on one, on two, on some number here. So it was five, for example, then in four. You have performed that operation in all the objects. And then you are performing this else. Ah, so, so for it, it happens at the end of the loop? Yes. Uh, after everything is executed. Everything is executed. Okay. Yeah. So yes, so this else is performed yeah. only at the end of the loop. Okay, now so I'm maybe I have some example down there. So I, I should check my notebook. Yeah, I know it's uh, a tricky thing uh, because we don't have that part uh, of the loop 
in any other language, at, at least uh, the ones I know. So I haven't seen that in any sort of C or C++ or JavaScript or whatever. So <clears throat> everything I have seen, it was a little bit, um, it, it had in that else statement. Ah, and there is, here is an example for you. Uh, so uh, here is the program uh, that checks uh, whether some number is prime. We have a while loop uh, that iterates uh, through all the numbers and check if I can divide number y by some number. And uh, you see uh, the thing here, if I am getting some factor in that loop, I'm printing that uh, the number has some factor. In this case, it has factor 11. And I break. So I'm stopping the loop. So there's no need to check whether the number is prime if I have already found some sort of divisor for that number. Uh, and I have else statement in here. Uh, in this statement, I print uh, that y is prime. Uh, so the whole reason for this code uh, is that if I get through all the while and I never break, it means that I have never found any uh, number that I can divide y with that number. So it doesn't just uh, work. So every time I get some sort of remainders. And that means that I can now run that else statement and I can bring that y was a uh, prime number. So here is an example of using that else. Maybe a really tricky part, so um, people rarely use that. Uh, but as you will probably work with some else's, someone else's code, uh, I guess it's a really nice idea to know something about it. And <clears throat> don't be confused when you see that. Uh, I, gu uh, I guess this, uh, I guess this behavior of else after for loop can be uh, like uh, executed in a way if we will use a specific Boolean variables that will serve as a flag, like we will state it as the beginning of the for loop, we will denote it as false. And then if uh, during the for loop, we will go into that if statement, we'll have the factor, we will change this Boolean variable to true. And after the execution of the whole for loop, there will be just like another if statement. So if that Boolean flag is true, we say that it is uh, an odd number, and if it uh, boolean flag remained false through all of the for loop, we will say that it's an even number. Oh, I just, yes, I just, I, I maybe I messed up with odd and even, but uh, I hope you get the idea. Yeah. Yes, yes, you are perfectly correct. And if you check this code on the table, if you see, that's exactly that is written there. So I have created a new variable, great, that I have set to false. So here is the equivalent code for this else statement. So new variable false. I set it to true when it's time to break, just before breaking. And I'm checking if if I break or I didn't in a new if statement behind the loop. So here are two equivalent code, two equivalent codes I have written for you. And yeah, that's exactly what we have described. So I'm I'm creating some sort of flag. And I'm you and I'm using that flag after the for statement uh, to check if there were any breaks or something like that. <clears throat> uh, okay, so examples of for cycle, I guess uh, you have seen that uh, a very nice function range uh, that will help you create for cycles uh, through some numbers, some integer numbers. Uh, you can use two numbers inside to get uh, range from 10 to 15. Uh, the upper bound is always excluded. Uh, that was maybe done for the purpose. So, for example, if you are iterating uh, through some indices of the list, uh, you can write range of len of that list. So, function len will get you the length of the list. Uh, but you remember, programmers are not simple people. Yeah, we are always counting from zero. So normal people count from one. We do that from zero. Uh, so that's why if you have len of the list like 10, the uh, biggest index you can use to reference some element in that list is nine because we started counting from zero. Uh, so range uh, does that like subtraction of one 
full loop. So it starts from zero, but it never gets to the bound you have written. So if you write range of length of some list L, uh, you will get all the numbers starting from zero to that length minus one. So you can safely reference all elements in that list uh, using that number as an index. <clears throat> But in some different cases, it may be a source of confusion for you. So please just remember that uh, fact that the upper bounds are very often in Python. They are stripped with that one. Uh, we will see a very similar. Well, we have already seen a similar behavior uh, when we are doing uh, list slices. So when we are doing a slice in a list, uh, the upper bound, uh, we, will ne we never get to that index of the upper bound. We always get minus one. And we'll be doing similar things with a NumPy library. Uh, that's the next lecture I will show you. Uh, and um, we will get the same sort of behavior uh, there. And now we see that the same sort of behavior we have in uh, these ranges. <clears throat> A few more simple examples. But so that's okay. Uh, list comprehension. Uh, a really nice feature I like in Python. Uh, I know many people hate it <laughs> uh, because they say that uh, it makes uh, code un unreadable. Uh, basically, I like this feature. Uh, this is a special syntax uh, for creating lists. And the same syntax or, let's say, very similar syntax you have for dictionaries, to create dictionaries. Uh, and and it comes from mass. Uh, so you probably have heard about so-called set builder notation. So when you are uh, describing some sets you want to work with, and you are saying that here I am taking elements from some super, super set, and, but they should satisfy some sort of condition, and that will give me my new set. Uh, and here is the list builder notation written in the same form. Uh, so here is... Uh, you write four, uh, you write x in something, so you are like iterating through something, uh, and you can create new elements uh, that are basically for x's or some function on that x. Here is x squared, and you see the list of 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. <clears throat> Uh, you can put through, uh, you can put few, uh, cycles inside of there. So, for x in ABC, for y in ABC, uh, you can add ifs to do some filtering inside that. Uh, so when you are creating a list, you can do a whole lot of stuff like filtering some data, like iterating through some things, uh, and, uh, at the end of the day, combining them just into one entity. So, uh, that's a really nice, uh, thing to do and, uh, <clears throat> that make you makes you to write in one line of code some maybe quite complicated things that will need for you a few for statements and so on. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, we have we have something like I get I guess twenty minutes left. <clears throat> uh, so let's check what what else I may want you to show. Uh, to get you aware of uh -huh. how not to change the list. <clears throat> but Alex, maybe we make a short break and then continue. Uh, because it's not 20, it's like 30 minutes. Uh -huh. Okay, maybe let's do a five minute break and then we can continue with that. I will show you some, some more things and then... Okay, so, so let, let's get a break, five minutes. Uh, okay, now uh, returning to uh, the examples. So I wanted to show you some example uh, that I thought I will not change uh, a list. Uh, so here is a list L uh, that contains a bunch of uh, numbers. <clears throat> uh, here you see a little bit uh, different uh, representation uh, of that list that shows its internal structure with all that pointers getting to objects with uh, integer numbers. In previous examples, I didn't do that. So I just showed them like uh, sitting and all that cells of the list, uh, just not to clutter the image. So I don't want uh, to make too many uh, like arrows or object uh, objects in, in here. Uh, but this uh, case is an exception. <clears throat> so 
So what I want you to show is uh, how internally uh, will the following very simple code work. So for X and L. So what do we expect from this curve? So we expect some sort of iteration. So I will get with X through all the objects that sit in L. Okay. And I will do X plus equals to 10. <clears throat> uh, now I want you to think what will happen. So how this thing will work when I will start to iterate uh, through this list? Shouldn't we define x first? Uh, uh, for x in L uh, already defines x as the variable. So it knows that uh, x is a list uh, component. Or uh, yes, mm -hmm. it knows. And at every uh, other uh, like iteration of the cycle, uh, this x changes. Mm -hmm. So it references the zeros component, the first component, the second component, and so on, until we get to the end of the list. So that's basically the syntax of uh, the first cycle. And how does it know that x should change? It knows that we should add 10. To yes. the number, but uh, how does it know that we sh after adding it should go to the next uh, list element? Uh, when you get to the end of the cycle, uh, you are returning to the beginning and you are iterating uh, once again with the next x. Uh, so that's very similar uh, when you are doing, for example, cycle in uh, C++. When you are getting to the end of the cycle, you return at the beginning and you do, uh, and you start the another iteration. Of course, if uh, condition is uh, okay, true, and uh, so on. Uh, this works in a very similar fashion. So just that in means that you are iterating uh, through the list, taking every every component one by, by one and performing that block of uh, code. And this is a bit of a tricky question uh, that is based on all that facts about mutability, immutability, all that thing I told you before. <clears throat> uh, so how do we expect this cycle to work? And how it actually works? Probably it uh, won't. Uh, it, it shouldn't change the list, probably. Uh, why? So, uh, the reason? Uh, because we are using, um, like, uh, co common, I don't know, variable in list, which uh, I, I think sometimes is ab abstracted, like, from the source, but I don't uh, okay, uh, let's uh, get once again. So uh, we have uh, numbers, integers, uh, in the list. Uh, these are immutable objects. So whenever I do something with that object, I don't change it. I don't change it. I can't change this int that contains 1. Uh, just change that 1 into, for example, 10 or 45. I can't do that. It's immutable. If I want 45, I need to create a separate object of the type int and put that number into there, so that's 45. So here what happens, I'm iterating through the list. So I'm getting x, the uh, first component of the list. It's a little bit <clears throat> hard to see maybe because uh, these arrows are not very, <clears throat> not very well aligned. Uh, but you see that x is now referencing the same object as the zeros element of the list. Now I'm doing x plus equals 10. But int is immutable. So I can't just put here in here 11. I should create a separate object and put 11 in there. And now the name x is basically connected to uh, the new object that contains 11, while the old object still lives in the memory, it rests, it rests intact, and it is still referenced by the list. The same thing happens 
when I do the second iteration. So I have finished my iteration of the for cycle of the for loop. I returned at the beginning of the for loop. And now I am taking taking the element indexed one. <clears throat> now my X, my name X, is referencing the same object uh, that uh, the list element number one references. But once again, it's int. It's immutable. If I do something to that int, it will never change that object. It will create the new one and repurpose my name X to, to be now connected with that new object. And that's what happens. So once again, I'm creating new object 12. Now X is referencing that 12, but it has nothing in common with that two that we had in the list. And the list still rests intact. So nothing changes. And the same thing I perform again and again. <clears throat> at, and, the, and at the end of the day, uh, the situation is that I have iterated through the list. I performed that sort of adding of 10, but nothing changed. If I had some mutable objects in that list, if I had some mutable objects in that list, what would happen to them? They will change. Yes, they will change. If I had some mutable objects that plus equals, uh, had at least the ability to change them, they could have changed, and then referencing the list, I will see their all that objects have changed somehow. So that really depends on that mutability and immutability. So I know that may be a, a little bit complicated concept, but I want you to know that at the at the start of working with Python, uh, because there are many places uh, that you can get into that trouble. Just looking at this code, it looks like I'm taking a list and I made it paint to each of its elements. That is what I will expect from that. But if we are getting a little bit deeper, if we are at least printing that list after the cycle, we should be surprised. So why? I have performed a whole lot of work. I stepped through the cycle. I have iterated through all this, the whole cycle. I performed some adding something and nothing changed. Why? Because of the immutability. And I have, and I can have a quite separate part of code when I am iterating through, through the list of some mutable objects. I'm changing that object and I will see that everything changes. So this makes uh, a big difference. <clears throat> okay, how do we change the list in this case? Well, probably the simplest thing is to iterate uh, through possible indices and change the list uh, referencing its elements with the indices. That will explicitly uh, make our list to reference basically some new objects and um, our list will change. So here's an example. <clears throat> I'm doing LE plus equals 10. So right now I'm working with the cell index E in the list. And whatever I do, that's, that should influence that cell because I'm working with it. <clears throat> and of course, here is the part of code I told you about before. So E in range len L. So here is range that creates for you a range to iterate within that range. So now uh, variable i will change from 0 to len l minus 1. You remember we never get to the uh, uh, to this number. We always get one lower. <clears throat> and now iterating through the list, I will change the list. So you see that now I have elements 11, 12, 13, 14 in the list. OK. <clears throat> A uh, few more interesting things. Um, uh, we have some functions uh, that really help us when working with lists. Uh, we don't, uh, at least I haven't seen them in uh, other programming languages, but probably uh, we will sooner or later see that in C++. I'm guessing, I'm feeling like we will get that at some point. Uh, and one is enumerate. 
that allows you uh, to not just iterate through uh, the list itself, like getting the value from each cell of the list, uh, but getting the index of that value on each iteration of the list. So here is the syntax. Uh, I can drop uh, these brackets. Uh, that will still work, so that will be still OK. <clears throat> uh, but in this, uh, inside of this cycle, now I will have two variables, x and i. x will give me the value of the i's uh, component of the list. And I, of course, uh, will be the index that will help me to reference that list and change their function. <clears throat> uh, function zip. Uh, I think that's a really uh, useful uh, thing. Uh, we don't have it, once again, in many other programming languages, but it's really nice to have. Uh, if you have two lists and you want to iterate uh, through them synchronously, so I want to take the first element of the first list and the first element of the second list. I want to take the second element of the first list and the second element of the second list, and so on and so forth. Uh, I can do that with one for cycle and using this sort of uh, zip function. So you see the syntax here. Uh, very similar thing to work for uh, dictionaries. Uh, I guess you can check uh, some documents to, to see how it works. Uh, functions <clears throat> uh, defined really easy. Uh, write uh, def name of the function, and in the brackets uh, you can write uh, some sort of arguments of the function. <clears throat> uh, then column, and uh, <clears throat> then you write the body of uh, the function. So what it should do. <clears throat> Uh, calls are really simple, name of the function, and in the brackets you give some arguments you want to apply your function to. Uh, very interesting thing uh, of uh, the Python um, is uh, the fact uh, that it tries to apply the function uh, to whatever you put into there. Uh, <clears throat> well, I basically forgot the academic term uh, for this thing. Uh, but the idea is uh, that it doesn't really matter what types are connected to the names you are writing to your function, or to work, what are types of the objects you are passing to it. It will try to perform operations on that object, of course, if that operations are defined. If they are not defined, you guess it, we get an exception. Yeah, So it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. We are trying to do what we can. If at some point we are stuck, we can do that. We just throw away an exception. Uh, this leads to interesting uh, things. Like, for example, you are writing a function times that multiplies x and y. Of course, you can apply it to numbers, to number 2 and number 4 to get 8. That's OK. But you can apply it to string and a number. String times number, uh, you have an overloaded ver version of the times uh, of that multiplication. And you get that uh, three, uh, string, let's say, multiplied four times. So we have the string high and we have high four times. <clears throat> uh, so it's sort of uh, polymorphism in Python. And that may be the reason uh, uh, that. Uh, I don't know, let's say it's architecture of the Python programs uh, really uh, may really differ from the architecture for uh, of some, for example, C++ programs, at least in some cases. Uh, because in C++, if you want to have some polymorphism, you should create some abstract class. Uh, you should have inheritance from that class and so on. So you have a really complicated tree of classes. Uh, to get polymorphism in Python, uh, you don't need anything of that. If your class implements uh, that functions that you may uh, that you want to use on it, you don't need to inherit any uh, specific uh, interface or any specific abstract class or whatever. Uh, you just put the object of your class into the function that will perform everything it need to, needs to perform, and that will work. <clears throat> So I don't need uh, the string to be is some sort of, uh, to inherit from some i multipliable class or something like that. I just put it into the function times, I get the result. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, so that that makes in many cases that makes the code simpler, uh, simpler uh, and shorter. Uh, of course, uh, many people disagree and say that we need to retreat to the style of that C plus plus programs and still write some classes that gives uh, that give us the hint uh, what will happen. Uh, well, that basically that depends. So that depends uh, if you will work in some company, uh, you will have some code writing guidelines, and uh, you will probably know uh, what is expected from. You. So can you do the Pythonic way as it was intended when, uh, when the Python was invented? Or uh, you should do that uh, the other way and still write some sort of classes just to have some, some hints. <clears throat> In some sense, Python is getting closer and closer to C++ uh, because you know that now we have uh, type hints in a new Python. I don't write them here. Uh, they are not necessary and by no means they influence the code, uh, the Pythonic code. It's some sort of part of, let's say, of documents or documentation of your code. Mm, but uh, they are extensively used uh, in uh, in programming and different companies, uh, if you look their code uh, guidelines, they will uh, tell you that they want to see that type hints and they want you to check somehow types uh, when you are passing them to the function. So they don't really want this polymorphism. So it's a really interesting uh, point to think about it. Uh, so whether you like that uh, behavior of Python or you don't like that behavior of the Python and basically what do you want to get from that behavior? <clears throat> uh, here is an example. Well, why, why, why not uh, to, to just uh, use C? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, well, uh, I think at the beginning of the lecture, I told you that uh, there are some uh, points why do we love Python? And maybe the biggest uh, uh, such point is that we have some enormous number of libraries for the Python. So for almost anything we can think in our life, so whatever we will need to calculate, uh, you will almost certainly find some library somewhere on the GitHub or whatever. And you can easily install it and you can use it uh, quite easily. <clears throat> and it's really a good thing uh, because if you are researching something, uh, you don't want to write your whole code from scratch. Uh, it's really good if you have some already uh, complete libraries that will do something for you. So for example, plot something. So we will use matplotlib and uh, you will see that plotting is uh, quite simple. Uh, so you don't want to write your own, your own library to get some plot of sine or cosine. Uh, you want to do some sort of science. You want to multiply functions, some, do some, I don't know, transformations and just plot them. You don't want to think about how the plotting thing, the thing works. And you will have a whole lot of uh, scientific libraries in Python. So, for example, for doing some quantum computations or uh, something in condensed matter physics and so on and so forth, uh, you will have uh, many libraries um, to do uh, some machine learning. So be that with neural networks or be that classical machine learning or so whatever, uh, you already have all that incorporated into Python. So that makes it a really good point to start because you already have a whole lot of things that you can reuse and you don't need to, uh, to write them in your own. Uh, and the syntax of Python, of course, it makes it uh, maybe a little bit easier to prototype. So if you are just checking some idea, you don't want to get the perfect code, you don't want to many other things. Uh, you just will want to know, does this idea work or it doesn't? And Python makes really easy to write some prototypes and to check whether your idea works. So maybe uh, you did something wrong when doing some calculations. Uh, maybe you have some wrong architecture and so on and so forth. And it's really a good point to start here to check your idea. And only when you are sure that your idea works and uh, everything comes together, uh, you can... Uh, you can basically rewrite that in any other programming language you want uh, if there is some reason for it. For example, uh, you want it to be a little bit weaker or you found some 
libraries for different languages that are better in some sense, I don't know. Uh, but it's really good good point to start to do a prototype in, in Python. And that's why machine learning engineers love them uh, so much, because we can do our prototypes, we can check our models and throw them away if they don't work and uh, quickly create new ones that may work. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, okay, few thanks. more minutes. Um, I wanted to tell you something about scopes, but maybe you will read it uh, somewhere else. Um, some parts work as expected. So uh, you have some uh, local scope when you are creating the variables, for example, inside a function, and that variable is seen just inside this function. So quite expected behavior. Uh, you have seen that in many other programming languages, at least uh, I can think of a programming language that <coughs> uh, won't implement that feature. Uh, you can access some global variables uh, from the inside of uh, the function. That's okay. Uh, <clears throat> you have some keywords like global or uh, or non-local. Um, I don't want to stop at, uh, at this point. Uh, just want to make you a hint that in some cases, if you are creating uh, a new variable inside the function, uh, that will create that variable locally. So if I write x equals y plus z, uh, that would, that should have been a local variable. Uh, but in the case I write, uh, before that something like keyword global and x, that will make my variable global. Uh, I don't want to stop at this point because we all know that global variables are sort of evil. Uh, we don't want them too much, at least in our code, uh, because creating some global variable, uh, that's always, uh, may make you some troubles, uh, because someone can change it and you will have some problems. So you can't control what happens to that variable. So you probably don't want any global variables in your code, or at least you want them, a small number of that variables as you can have. Uh, because you can't just control them really well. <clears throat> uh, here are a few words about the functions, uh, <clears throat> how they are called. So you can call the function just by uh, getting all the arguments in place. You can use names of the arguments, uh, really nice feature. So here I'm calling the function f abc, and I'm writing this abc in some quite random order but I am referencing them by name, so they will be, they will get into place that they should be. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there are a few features, uh, like you can, of course, some of them write um, just by, by place, some referencing by name, and so on. Uh, some features you will see in the documentation, like star arcs and two star, uh, two stars arcs, uh, that is the feature uh, to get any number of argument that you pass to that function. So I can pass to this function f one argument, I can pass 100 arguments, uh, that will still work. Uh, inside the function, this arcs will look like a list, a list of some objects, each of them is an argument. And of course, the first argument you pass gets to the beginning of the list, the second is behind this element, and so on and so forth. Uh, two stars, it means when you are passing them by name, and you see that uh, inside of the function, uh, like a dictionary. So here I'm printing f from a equals 1, b equals 2, and it prints just all that arcs, you see them as a dictionary. Mm, I don't think that you will use something like that at the beginning of your, uh, let's say, machine learning career, uh, but uh, you will see a whole lot of this stuff uh, in uh, the documentation. So almost every function in every library we will use will have somewhere at the end all the named arguments with some more or less meaningful names will have something like star and arcs. 
two stars and arcs, something like that. And you should know that this is just the possibility to pass some additional arguments into that function. In some cases, it may be a very meaningful operation if that function uses some other function and that other function needs some arguments and you don't know beforehand what are these arguments, uh, you may want to use this technique to equip your function with some additional arguments that will be passed through it to that other function called. Uh, yes, I see a question. Yeah, but I think there is a better way to solve this problem with passing a function, arbitrary function, with uh, parameters that we don't know before the program started. We can just capture the function and its arguments into the lambda function and pass it to the app function. And this is yes. the way this problem is solved, for example, in C++, where we don't have these P arcs and key arcs. Yes, you can solve this problem in different ways, uh, but you will probably be uh, seeing, uh, in some cases, solution uh, this way. <clears throat> so it may it may be really you may solve that really in different uh, different ways. Uh, maybe you can even create uh, I don't know um, some argument that takes just a list, some explicit list, and uh, that list uh, will be put as arguments to the different function. <clears throat> so that that depends. Uh, but in some cases, I saw this sort of solution. So probably you should be ready to to see it somewhere and understand what happens. So the problem is not like uh, we are always writing the code, but we are mostly reading the code. And in some cases, we need to know even the techniques uh, we don't want to employ ourselves. Because we may treat these techniques as bad or we just don't like them, so whatever. Uh, but we still need to know them uh, because we can see them in some other's code and it may be crucial for us to understand what's happening because we need to use that code. It's some part of the library or, I mean, once again, you're working somewhere in the enterprise and you have just some part of the code that you write and all the rest of the program, uh, some different people wrote and you need to understand their code to interact with it correctly. <clears throat> okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, okay, so that was about the functions, uh, and the last thing uh, to tell you, uh, just one or two minutes, uh, it's about modules. So Python has a really nice feature of uh, so-called modules. Uh, it differs from what you have seen in C++ and or maybe some other languages. <coughs> in C++, you are just taking a part of code and you are incorporating that into your translation, uh, so-called translation model. Uh, in Python, uh, you are mm, importing things. Uh, so uh, these modules are, in most cases, some separate Py files. Uh, they are living somewhere outside. Uh, but you can import them. And uh, what is more interesting, uh, you are not just importing the bare files, so like interest, uh, like inserting all the code into your. No, it's not that way. Uh, you are uh, when you are importing something, Python understands these structures in that file, and you can import uh, just one structure from there. You can rename them on the fly, and so on. <clears throat> Uh, so, for for example, I have some uh, some module. Let's call it module one. Why? I have a function there, so I call it printer, uh, and I can import that module with keyword import, and I can use uh, the function printer from that module. Uh, if that module contains uh, many functions, I don't want all of them. I can import just one function from there. So here is an example from module one, import printer. And I get just a function called printer that I can now uh, reuse. <clears throat> and this is very, let's say, convenient because in a module, I can have, I don't know, hundreds of functions. 
Uh, and it's not really convenient when some names are overlapping with the names I'm having in my model. So that may lead to some sort of confusion and to some really nasty bugs in the code. <clears throat> but when I'm importing only the functions I need, uh, that's a really nice, uh, really nice touch because uh, uh, now I can use only those functions and I will probably not confuse them with my own functions because I know what I've imported, it's uh, some explicit operation. Uh, of course, I can import everything just using uh, star. Uh, it gets everything that module exports, uh, but probably you won't do that. You should know about this possibility, but probably you don't want to do that because you don't know what lives inside that module, and maybe some functions will overlap with your own, and you will get some sort of confusion and some problems. <clears throat> Uh, you can rename the model in case you have, I don't know, uh, you don't like the name or you have a variable that is called a bad model in your code or something like that. Uh, you can write import module one as, let's say, md, <clears throat> and you can use it as previously, so that's really okay. Uh, here were some examples of, uh, that's to, <clears throat> To dusty corner to get in uh, when you have a few modules and you're having some functions that have the same name in that modules and you are importing everything what do you get uh tricky question but hopefully you will never get into that situation or uh you can check this notebook or any books to get the idea what happens uh okay uh so that's basically at the end, I wanted to tell you a few words about um, writing classes in Python. Uh, probably for our purpose, as uh, we are working with uh, some simple machine learning with sklearn and so on. Uh, so of course you want to know how to import some some import some modules because we will be importing some sklearn, some numpy, whatever. So it's really good to know. Uh, but our code will be kept quite simple, so you probably won't need to write any classes. Uh, but you need to know how to use them, because in that module you will have some sort of classes, you will need to create some objects of that classes and so on. <clears throat> so I don't want to get really uh, into details. Uh, I will just uh, tell you that, of course, uh, you have some quite simple uh, syntax for creating classes in Python. Uh, so here's an example. So class, first class, it has just a few functions, set data and display. Uh, I'm creating uh, two names, X and Y, and uh, <clears throat> now they reference uh, two instances of this class. So one instance and the second instance, two different instances. Uh, I'm setting data into X, and you see that I'm setting uh, is data. <clears throat> now is data is uh, King Arthur. Uh, once again, I'm setting data, but this time to Y. It gets its own data. <clears throat> and of course, I can call some functions like display on X, and it will bring me some of the data <clears throat> I have in there. Uh, I can reference uh, internal uh, variables of the class uh, by using uh, this sort of syntax like something dot uh, internal variable. Um, not a very good style, but in some cases you will see that syntax, so you probably need to know that. Uh, of course, calling the function x dot name of the function, you are calling uh, display function <coughs> from this from this object x. Uh, <coughs> so basically, you will need to use that. You don't need to know how to write these classes. Uh, you don't need to know all these things like these special functions in the class that are constructor, destructor, and so on. Uh, we have that in Python. Uh, they have some sort of uh, special syntax, like uh, you are writing two underscores, then let's say init, then two underscores. So that will be your function that constructs the class. Uh, all functions in the class uh, that belong uh, to some object uh they will have first argument that references the object you are working with uh in python they are often called self in c plus plus you have seen similar thing uh you called it uh, this 
you have the pointer this to <coughs> to the object. Uh, in Python, you have this first argument cell, so written explicitly, and you can use that to uh, reference some data in your class. So uh, you can see in, uh, internals. I write self dot data uh, just to access the data of uh, the class. <coughs> Uh, you may have a question, how do we hide uh, the data inside the class so no one can change that? Uh, there are some techniques, but they are a little bit complicated. Uh, so in Python, as was originally thought, uh, uh, it was there was no idea of uh, doing any private uh, variables. So you don't have private variables in classes in Python. Uh, and basically, I understand the logic that people put into their uh, because uh, if you having if you are having some variable, uh, and there is of course a convention that if you name a variable starting, for example, with underscore, you should treat that as a uh, private variable. But it doesn't mean that you are restricted to access to that variable. And the thing is uh, that uh, when people created this, I understand their logic because they thought, well, if I told you this is a private variable. I need it in my class for some internal things, then you don't better mess with it, so don't change it. If someone changes it, he gets a broken, he gets a broken program. So okay, it's his problem. He broke the, pro the program, maybe he did that intentionally, okay. What's of that? It, it doesn't mean that uh, my class doesn't work or, or something like that. Uh, okay, so with that being uh, said, <clears throat> Uh, I guess it's, uh, I have covered more or less uh, everything you may see in the Python. Uh, of course, uh, um, we can't expect that in uh, just hour and a half I can teach you the Python, but I guess I did a big overview of what you can see there if you open any book on the Python and uh, check its syntax and how to work with it. And maybe I even have prevented you from uh, some misunderstanding of some con concepts, uh, very crucial concepts, uh, like all that mutability and immutability in Python, and uh, all these uh, things with passing references and so on. Uh, if anyone has some um, questions, comments, whatever, um, uh, ready. Uh, maybe one, one small comment. Uh... Uh, I, I know that uh, there was a meme about Python that it uh, uh, has uh, no switch uh, uh, syntax, but uh, it it read it like a year ago. So another thing to to, to use. It, it was like uh, so sh sh should use uh, a lot of ifs if it was a case for a, a lot of. Uh, like uh, 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 invari invariance, but now it's with switch Python. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Anything else? Anyone wants to add? If no, then then I think we are over. Thank you, everyone, for your attention, and we meet next Friday.